working, but I think we probably want to start getting off the ground since, as you know, it, with Effective Advocate, our first section of the night, the first 30 minutes is devoted to a briefing on important legislation and tonight's piece will be on DC statehood. And we are so very pleased to have Kelsey Adams here from DC vote with us. And then the second half of our program tonight will be a chance to get trained up on best practices for meeting with your members of Congress. We'll give you all the tips and tricks Feel free to stay on for both parts. And with that, let me just say that the Worker Circle is a Jewish social justice organization that is working for a multiracial democracy. We have been around for 124 years now. We have activists from ages five to 95, and we believe in putting muscle behind what, what our words say. And so we are very involved in legislative advocacy and also in direct action. If you're joining us tonight for the first time and you're not familiar with the Center for Common Ground, Andrea, why don't you introduce the Center for Common Ground? I am happy to do that, Noelle. And um, as Noelle said, today we'll be talking about the legislation for March, the messaging on DC statehood, how to meet your representative, what you do after the meeting, and then democracy circles. Um, I'm going to just be talking about Center for Common Ground. Center for Common Ground was founded in 2018, so it is not 120 years old. We are a civil rights and a voting rights organization, and our mission is simple. It is to empower underrepresented voters, thank voters who look like me and Kelsey and if you've got Hispanic friends, AAPI friends, Native American, we all know who we are, uh, to basically empower them, make it possible for them to vote their power, even if they live in a voter suppression state. So what we do here is figure out what the state is doing to suppress the vote, and then we come up with solutions so that voters and literally nimbly walk around that voter suppression. Right. So tonight, as I mentioned, we have a guest speaker, Ms. Kelsey Adams from Washington, D.C., who is going to be walking us through why statehood for the great city of Washington, D.C. is so important. Kelsey, unmute and take it away. Hey, everybody. Good evening. Thank you all so much for getting on with us this late in the evening. I know it's seven o'clock. Everybody could be doing other things. But today is the day that we're talking about D.C. statehood. I am thrilled to see that there are so many people on from across the country. It seems like we got a couple of states on the line, and that makes me enthusiastic for this call. Um, like I said, I'm Kelsey. I am from DC Vote, currently serving as its organizing director. Um, DC Vote has been on the forefront for the past 25 years, advocating for equality for the nearly 700,000 uh, residents of Washington, DC. Um, and I do want to give a shout out to my co-founder, Daniel Solomon. He is on the call, so I'm so glad to see him. And another shout out to Noah Wills from the Statehood Compact um, of Washington, DC. Uh, Noah sends out all of the resolutions that we do from DC for the state legislators to sign on for DC to become the 51st state. So thank you, Noah. Thank you, Daniel, for joining the conversation as well. Um, and it looks like we can go ahead and get into it. We do have um, a slide up right here. Um, so as you guys already know, um, residents of DC do not have a voice in our nation's Congress. So what that means is we do not have an actual vote. So when we're talking about reproductive rights, when we're talking about climate change, when we're talking about you name it, the answer could be two senators, right? The two senators will be from Washington, D.C. if we grant D.C. statehood. So D.C. statehood is the answer to whatever your problem is in your space as an organization, as an issue group. The answer is D.C. statehood. So we can stop looking past, oh, we need to go to this senator. We need to lobby this whole group of committee of people. We don't even need to do that. We actually 
could literally just lobby everybody to make DC the 51st state. And I do want to show my shirt really quick. All uh, right, on the fight to the 51st state. That is the answer. DC statehood is the solution to your problems in with whatever advocacy space that you're in. So, and, and when you really think about it, the nearly 700,000 residents that reside in Washington, DC also have to abide by federal laws. The city itself, as we know, was established to protect the nation's capital. But what happened on January 6th? So in the lamest terms, the constitution is now void because an insurrection did occur on January 6th and it was successful. That is the whole reason that DC was built. DC was built to protect the nation's capital. However, it was insurrected. So that fight and that uh, argument is actually null and void at this point, because at this point, uh, we've already had an insurrection. And so there's no reason why DC shouldn't be a state. As as a matter of fact, the mayor was unable to call the National Guard out from her space as a mayor to even have somebody to come and be on the front lines at that point. Maryland and Virginia had to call their National Guards. And that was the first form of defense there because keep in mind the mayor and the federal government weren't even um, on the same page when January 6th happened. Um, so we ended up having to call our friends in Maryland and Virginia to respond to an insurrection that was happening into our city. And so for starters, that is in lamest terms, the, the one reason why DC should be a state. Two, the constitution say we the people. It does not say we the people excluding the people in Washington DC, Guam and Puerto Rico. It fails to mention that. And so when we're talking about the people, the nearly 700,000 that reside in, D in Washington, D.C. should be a part of the conversation. Our voice should matter. No other municipality or jurisdiction or district in the whole country suffers from what we've experienced last year six times is what we call a disapproval resolution. So um, we know crime is up in the country. Crime is a, is a problem right now. Crime is a problem across our nation. Last year, D.C.'s council attempted to pass a crime bill to counteract some of the issues that we're facing in Washington, D.C. However, the president threatened to veto the bill. And furthermore, the House put out what they call a disapproval resolution, meaning that they didn't approve of the legislation that our city council was attempting to pass. This turned D.C. into a ruckus. We spent so much time in Congress last year. And, and the reason why that's a problem for you all, because you elected those members of Congress, and I'm sure you have problems that you want your members of Congress to tackle right now. However, they had to spend their time, okay, focusing on the issues of Washington, D.C. in a district that they don't reside in or that their constituents come from. The problem is we don't have a voice in our nation's Congress to represent us. We also don't vote the members that are in Congress into Congress. So we literally are just sitting here null and void for every legislation that's passed that affects what the, the, the residents here in Washington, DC. Now the common argument of DC is that, as we know, DC is made up of space between uh, Virginia, which was, uh, they gave us like a part of Alexandria and Arlington um, in which they took back and then a portion of Maryland. So a common argument is we could do something called retrocession. Now, to be clear, Maryland has made it clear that they do not wanna add an additional nearly 700,000 residents to their state. Why? They already have problems in their state. That wouldn't create, a, that wouldn't be successful, okay? That means the problems that DC residents would have would now be problems of the Maryland state legislator and then the Maryland Federal Council. So that is not the answer. Retrocession is just never the answer. So if you're ever somewhere um, and that comes up in conversation, you can literally say, well, retrocession will be giving the land back to where it came from. And they've already declared that they don't want to do that. And no one can and contest. Virginia doesn't literally... want you either. Yeah, Virginia already Virginia already gave us back. That's why our diamond is a little messed up. As you can see on my shirt, they ate their piece back anyway, you know. So <laughs> we've already faced that. And uh, myself and Noah, we actually were in uh, Maryland State Legislature on uh, Monday. And that is actually what they said out of their mouths in the committee hearing was that retrocession was not the answer. And they did not want to deal with the 700,000 plus residents of Washington, D.C., 
in Maryland. So we've heard it for our own in our own ears that the Maryland House says that that is not what um, they want to do. Now, what we do know is Vermont and Wyoming are both smaller than Washington, D.C. So the question is, how come they are states and we're not? That is very problematic there. So we do have a committee representat representative who is Delegate Holmes, Eleanor Holmes Norton, but she does not have a vote on the floor. So she can work in committees. She can amend things, amend bills before they make them to the floor. However, once any bill that she is, any bill though, that's federally for the entire 50 states and DC, Guam, Puerto Rico, whenever it comes out of committee, she, norm she no longer has a stake in that fight. Also problematic. What we know is once bills come out of committee and they do get to the floor, that is where all the conversations really are had. And so, again, we don't have a conversation to be had because we don't have a representative to speak for us. And I know everybody right now is we're talking about the we're talking about the genocide that's happening in Gaza. And you're telling your senators to or not to call for a ceasefire. Keep in mind, Congress is who puts this nation at war. We have military people in D.C., right? We don't have a member of Congress to declare for them to go to war. They're just going to go. And we know that DC was formerly Chocolate City in its originality. So I do see a question in the um, in the chat. We the point blank period. DC statehood is racial justice. It currently DC is forty seven percent black and brown. Uh, it used to be around seventy eight percent black and brown, but as gentrification is on the rise and the black and brown residents are being displaced to Maryland, unfortunately, so we're already still attributing to the poverty in, in Maryland by displacing people from D.C. to Maryland. We know that D.C. statehood is a racial justice issue because if people did not look like me and Andrea, uh, we would probably be more closer to becoming the 51st state, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so D.C. statehood is just all around a, a racial justice um, conversation. Now we do have home rule, so don't get us wrong. We do have some form of government. Um, we have a 14 member council and a mayor, well, 13 member council and a mayor. So we do have the framework um, for a government and our mayor would essentially become our governor and our council would become our state legislator uh, the same way a state operates if we were given statehood. Um, however, as like I just mentioned, the council did suffer from what they call a disapproval resolution as they tried to do their job as the elected officials that the actual residents of DC elected uh, tried to do their job. So that's also problematic. The people that we elect at the end of the day are not able to make the final decisions on what affects our livelihood and everyday life. So, and another thing is DC residents want DC to become the 51st state, an overwhelming, 86% of DC residents favor DC statehood. And that's full statehood, not a voting member in the house, not just two senators. We actually want full statehood. We want to be recognized as a state, as, as I just stated, being larger than two states. It's no time than now than to make us the 51st state because we, again, have a stake in this fight. All we need to do to become a state is for Congress to create an act, which would be that HR 51 that everybody's aware about. HR 51, we need to go ahead and sign that into place. And the president will also sign that into place and will be a state. It's no constitutional amendment needed for DC to become a state. So that's also very problematic. And we know that DC statehood has passed in the house. Yes, so S 51 has passed twice in the, in the house. So the last time that it passed was um, 2020, I think I wanna say 2020. Um, and so we know that it passed the house twice and it died in the Senate every time. So that's why our conversation has become a little more direct as far as who we want people outside of DC to target. It would be your Senator. Uh, we currently have 51 um, co-sponsors in the, um, in the House, 
but in the, I mean, yes, in the House, but in the Senate, that is where we have the problem. And we even see a problem in the Senate where we even look at our democratic values. So going back to the disapproval resolution, only seven democratic senators voted in our favor when the disapproval resolutions came about. That is also very problematic. So that really makes this issue a nonpartisan issue because when we needed Democrats to stand up, they did not. So we can't say, oh, we know Democrats are championing DC statehood because they literally left us out to dry, okay? So what we're saying now is we need people who were literally champion DC statehood and people who have a passion for autonomy. Taxation without representation is blasphemy. This country was founded on the lack of representation through taxation. That is what led to the Boston Tea Party. It's no reason that DC residents are suffering from the lack of statehood when those are the fundamental principles of American government. Washington DC residents also pay 86%, we have a lot of 86% going on, 86% more in taxes than the rest of the country as well. Now, housing the federal government, I could understand why we possibly could pay more in taxes because we do house the federal government. However, if we don't have a voice in that federal government, I feel the federal government should be making some funding from their own selves that can cover their space because we might not do what you got going on. We literally don't have anything to do with what is happening in our nation's Congress and it's because of the lack thereof of full statehood. I think a lot of times it's kind of falling on people's, uh, falling on deaf ears when we say that we're not a state and it's kind of hard to understand what that really means. Um, and it's like, okay, well, you do have a mayor, so you have somebody that's kind of, you know, representing you guys. No, I'm here to clear all of that up right now. No, that is not home rule. We 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 respect home rule, and we're glad that we have it because that is what we have. But to be clear, it's not even full home rule. I, I said this myself um, in a, in another conversation that we have to stop saying just home rule. It's actually limited home rule because our budget has to be reviewed and it has to be passed by Congress as well. So we can elect whoever, we can elect all the people we wanna elect in DC and we can think that they have the best ideas for Washington DC, but they too still answer to our nation's Congress. All of these things are very problematic. I mean, I could go on, but you know, I'm gonna give y'all the floor back because I'm sure there could be some questions and I would definitely love to answer them. All Before right. I say my next things, I do I do have something else to say though. Oh, Elsie, I love that. It's like somebody who speaks as passionately as I do, and I just got to sit and listen. John, do we have any questions in the chat? I'm gonna go see, back here. Did see one question. I wasn't sure if it was addressed already, but um, does racial inequality come to into play here? How are yes. to give voting rights to ethnic, ethnic minorities? I believe you addressed that already, but did you want to yes, say anything else? Uh, uh, what is the excuse no. they give for uh, to perpetrate this injustice? Oh, well, their answer is the Constitution says it. I, um, like I said, uh, well, no, that was Monday we was in the state legislature. Last Thursday, we had a hearing on the DC crime bill in, uh, in the oversight committee. So uh, that's the committee that the delegate um, Norton serves on as well. So we had a, a hearing on our crime bill. And the answer was, literally was because article, whatever, section, whatever of the constitution. And I can section tell you who it was. Delegate, yeah, I know, I do know, but I just hate it. I just hate it so much. <laughs> delegate Perry pulls out a pocket constitution and says that that is why he doesn't want DC to be a state. And he wanted to stand like, I know everybody uses that, that, uh, that new term, uh, standing on business. That was him standing on business by pulling the constitution out and saying, oh, because it says it. Sir, we've amended the Constitution several times, and it was written and four score again. and seven. Yeah, and it was written four score and seven. It is 2024. I don't think that a lot of things are applicable at this point. All right, great. 
Uh, yeah. Does the bill just need to go to the Senate or does it have to go back to the House? Right now, the bills are identical. S-51 and H.R. 51 are the same bill, the same language. So unless the Senate makes changes to the bill, it would not need to go to the House. The Senate would pass the bill. It would go to the president to sign. Whoa, and the questions are really, really, really flying through there. So I saw one from my buddy Chuck. What is the strategy to win DC statehood? I'm on mute. That is a long, that's an ongoing conversation about the strategy um, to get to, for us to gain full statehood. But for starters, what we do know we need is coalition building. We need people who actually reside in the 50 states want to be a part of a larger coalition that we're all doing the same work in various states, advocating to your state members um, for your house and for your Senate and on the state level. So that work that NOAA does passing those state level resolutions. We need all of those things to be happening at the same time unfortunately for us um and mind you we don't we don't have a voice so it's like we really have to call somebody in another state and then they have to call their senator um so the strategy for statehood is to get people who live in the 50 states what well, currently is to get people who live in the 50 states on board to the fight that's literally like step one and um, dc statehood yeah. wouldn't necessarily directly affect the presidential election as us being a state because we already vote in the presidential election but mind you we actually didn't have the right to vote in the presidential election at first either so that was another game for us is to be able to vote in the presidential election that came around um right before we got uh home rule and then i saw a question who are the uh five senators that are not on board of course, Man Cinema are not on board. <laughs> and um, I'm looking and I'm not able to figure this out quickly. I would really need to run the database to see who else in addition to Man King. Cinema. Oh, Angus King, King up in Maine. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, All right. And then do we have a fourth one? It is another one. All uh, right. Yeah. Who is it? Yeah, yeah. Angus King is not as problematic as Man Cinema, but he can be problematic. Kelly is the other one. Kelly is the other one. Mark Kelly, Arizona. Yes. Yep. All yep. right. As I said, this was great fun, and we had some great questions. What I want to do now is everything that you heard from Kelsey. We tried to put a lot of that in the letter. Now, we did not put in the letter that there are going to be two new Democratic senators in Congress, which is why you should do that. Number one, we are nonpartisan. And number two, um, we've got a hard enough fight without throwing red meat in front of the Republican senators. So the letter basically says, it starts off, Washington, D.C. is the most undemocratic city in America. Its residents have no U.S. senator, and the representative they have does not have a vote in Congress. Now, most of the Dems, so if you have a Democratic rep or a Democratic senator, they are probably in support of this bill. If your reps and your senators are on the other side, they are not in support of this bill. And then we explain that this bill creates procedures whereby the city of Washington, D.C., to be known as the state of Washington Douglas Commonwealth, would be admitted to the Union as the 51st state they would get two real senators with a real vote in the Senate and their representative would have a real vote 
in the house on bills that went to the floor. And so we basically says we want to um, address this lingering injustice by giving the people of DC a voice in Congress. There were many people who believed we had to do this by constitutional amendment. So we address this contrary to popular belief, a constitutional amendment is not required uh, for admission to the union. It's straightforward. We need a majority vote in the House, the Senate, and the signature of the president. And then, Josie, I love your clothes. The residents of the capital of the world's strongest democracy right now, that's kind of in air quotes, are denied the right to participate in that same democracy. This must change because for democracy to work, it must include everyone, regardless of color, party, city, or zip code. And that is basically our letter this month. So, you know, I have you. been really surprised at how many people forget that DC is not a state. You can talk to them about this and they're like, well, well, wait a minute. What do you mean? Oh, that's right. And they, it's almost as if there's a gap. Like we learned the 50 states in elementary school. I remember I had to learn the song, 50 nifty United States from 13 original colonies. And you know, you can list them all off, but who's missing? Washington, DC, of course. But what surprises me over and over again is how it has almost been erased from memory. And so we play such a vital role. Those of us who do not live in DC, who live in one of the 50 states, who have two senators, who have representatives, that we need to talk to the people that we know and remind them that over 700,000 people are not able to fully participate in our democracy, even though they support it with their taxes, even though they live under its rule. And so that is something that really is right at the heart, as, as in the letter it says, if we are truly a strong democracy, well then let's be one. And so the strategy of convincing senators, especially that are out there right now, that's the way forward. And that's gonna be up to those of us us who are not living in D.C. And so that's why we are so excited that you're on this call tonight, because the whole point here is for you to gather with other people who feel similarly and get to your district office of your senators, of your members of the House, and let them know what you think. Oh, and Kelsey, I want you to drop a link in the chat. Yeah. There is so a I letter. wanted to yes and yep, I wanted to who is an organization please sign on to that letter for DC statehood it'll the link will be and it is our DC chat. um it is our DC uh statehood appropriations letter. Um, and Beautiful. just giving you guys the first paragraphs. Um, we actually need the this letter that I just put in the group chat. Um, and I say, email me if you want to uh, sign your organization on. I'm actually trying to get to 51 signatures by 10 a.m. tomorrow. And I actually need to submit the letter tomorrow because um, Congress will be passing uh, a bill on. Uh, oh, no, they will be they will be going into committee to talk about the bill on Monday. So um, as instructed by Eleanor's office, I want to go ahead and get this to them tomorrow. But the first paragraph is just, we, the undersigned organization, write to urge the Appropriations Committee to remove all language from the District of Columbia FY 2024 Appropriations Legislation, usurping the D.C. Council's local control and imposing the will of Congress onto D.C.'s nearly 700,000 residents. Legislative budget writers go against the intent of the Home Rule Act and our country's founding principle of self-government. So like I said, the letter goes right into how Congress is operating around DC is a blanket statement on home rule being limited. So they should not be limiting the home room that they did give us. Furthermore, they should be granting self-government for the nearly 700,000 residents of Washington, DC. I love it. All right, it is now time for us to go through the 
this is how you advocate. So hopefully we will have a number of people visiting their local Senate and or representative offices in their hometown. So why are we going to bother to advocate? Because we are seeking to influence, we want to persuade, we want to bring pressure to bear, and we need to be consistent and persistent. Now, our friends in D.C., they have been fighting this fight for decades. Let's bring this to a successful close. Now, when we are talking to people about this bill um, and you're talking to your legislator, now, number one, your legislator is going to be very interested in you because you didn't go to D.C., you went to the local office. And this is suddenly, oh boy, the folks back home know what is going on. So, oh, Nicole, you do this part. This is your Oh, part. no, no, that's fine. I, I loved what you were you were saying, Andrea. Oh, all right, all right. Um, yeah, it, I, it really I, does. When you go to the district office, it really underscores, actually, that you're incredibly serious about the advocacy you're doing. You know, so many of their constituents don't even know where the district office is, let alone ever make a visit there. Your power is strong in that district office. So when you go in there, when you're meeting with them, you want to talk to them about why is this bill important? And remember, you do not have to be the expert on HR 51 or S 51. That is not your job. Your job is to speak about your values, is to share a story, is to talk about why this matters. Those are the- No, well, can I- Yes. Can I add, can I add in something? Please, actually, in I somebody. would actually, I actually would hope you guys could speak to why you don't want to run DC. Like if they say anything about DC, be like, I don't know because I don't live there. And you <laughs> are my representative. So you should care about my problems that are right here where I live. There More you go. Importantly, you should know about DC. There you go. There you go. So one of the things often is when you're advocating for a bill, you talk about, especially, does this affect you directly? This is so interesting because in this case, it affects all of us indirectly that DC cannot fully participate in our democracy. And that's a matter that's very deep for us. When we when we are standing up in this way, we're saying, look, DC residents can't go to their senators. DC residents don't have a way to do this. They need all of us to stand up for DC as a state. And we expect you as our elected leader to understand the seriousness of this, and to vote accordingly. And so you want to talk about what is the value that um, that really drives you to this? Maybe it's about the fundamental equality of all citizens of the United States. Maybe it's about an de inclusive democracy. For those of you who might be people of faith, perhaps your faith is driving you to make a particular bid for DC statehood. Whatever that value is, whatever that story is, that's what you want to offer to um, your member of Congress because those they can take those stories, they they think about those values, and then you encourage them. When they co-sponsor that bill, you say, come on now, bring some more of your colleagues on board. The One of the things uh, sometimes that we can think is, hey, should I go make a visit to a senator that's already on record as co-sponsoring this bill? And the answer is, Absolutely, yes. They need to know you appreciate what they're doing. You need They need to be able to point to you. They want to say, my constituency made me do it. It sort of gives them extra nonviolent ammo when they're in there fighting away for our democracy. And remember your stories. And maybe it's a story, uh, maybe you used to live in DC or maybe um, you uh, are planning to move to DC. You might have an own personal narrative. Maybe you went to college in DC and realized while you were there that you were really stuck, that you wanted to be able to vote, 
there, but you couldn't vote there. So whatever that personal story is, that value that you have, that's the kind of thing that they really remember. Yes, 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 yes. And, yeah. and I know another good point that people talk about to use statehood is a lot of people want to legalize marijuana, but that's not happening without DC becoming a state. Just point blank period. With people on both sides of the aisles, we still need those two senators from Washington, D.C. All right. I agree. Now, why are we talking to our elected officials anyway? Number one, it is our responsibility as citizens. My mother used to have a saying, if there is something that you want and you ask, but you don't get shame on the person you ask. If there is something that you want and you didn't ask, shame on you. Now, Democracy is a participatory sport. We make it stronger by participating in it. And democracy is a bipartisan issue. Our power is in our district. All politics are local. When you show up as a voter in their district, in their office, that is a, oh, this person can vote for me or this person can vote against me. And now there is this, all right, how many friends do they have? Are they part of an organization? Are they part of a church? Who are they really? You make a big difference in your hometown. Your representatives normally are happy to see you. All right, for years they weren't happy to see me because I never made appointments and I just barge in. But you are all nice and lovely people. They will be very, very happy to see you. My representatives used to run for me when they saw me. I think what you're saying is important, Andrea, because for those of you who have never made a visit, it can be, I know, you sort of have to get the courage up, you make the phone call, you stop by. But I want to assure you that even those uh, senators that may be absolutely opposed to what you're advocating for, by and large, you will be treated with respect by the administrator that you're speaking with and by the senator that you're meeting with or by the staff. So don't be nervous if you're in a position of disagreement even with the senator. It's very important that you go anyway and trust that you'll be heard. All right, excellent. And again, advocacy, legislative or otherwise, is built on relationship building. You cannot have a relationship with people that you've never met. So this gives you, and we do these courses every month and every month it's something different. There are tens of thousands of bills that get introduced in Congress. And every month we pick one and focus on that. So, Every time you go into that office, you are going to learn more about the people who work there and you are going to learn more about what is important to the legislator that currently holds that seat. Do you share any common values? One of my favorite legislators that I always went to see when I was on the Hill was a Republican legislator from North Carolina because he would always listen to everything that I had to say and I wanted to hear his arguments. Sometimes he would tell me, I've got to think about that. You've given me uh, food for thought. Other times he would tell me flat out, there is no way I'm going to support that. And other times he would thank me for coming in and giving him a perspective that he had just missed this. Because again, remember, they're looking at tens of thousands of bills. It's easy to miss the important parts of one bill. Now, again, what's effective? Turning no into maybe, turning maybe into yes, turning yes into can I help build support? So no matter what they say, there is always a next step. You are driving 
trying to move them on to the next action. Now, I know some of the orgs here might be 501c3s, um, or you might be a member of a church congregation. 501c3 organizations can lobby. We can advocate. The limit is based on how much of our budget are we expending to do it. When you form a 501c3, you do not stop being a citizen of the United States. And it is your right to talk to the people that are elected and tell them what you want, or in some cases, don't want. Now, when you set up the meeting, you're going to want to make an official request in writing. And normally you can do that right on their website. Um, we are talking about meeting them in the local district office where you live. And now some offices are doing in-person visits. Other offices still kind of prefer Zoom. When you go, if possible, you want to show a broad base of support. Has there been a petition or can you get a copy of Kelsey's letter that's got all these organizations with thousands of members in them who say, yes, we support this? Legislators generally don't like being out there on the edge all by themselves. They like to know, oh, okay, I've got a bunch of groups behind me and my constituents are aware of this and my constituents are behind me. Yes, that is herd mentality, but that is what we are dealing with. Andrea, now, if I could jump yes. in for just a second, and you went, yes. if you go back to the last slide, you know, you can turn the letter that we've given you into a letter that's effectively a petition. Just take it to your to your PTA or take it to your soccer team or basketball team or your congregation. Invite Farmers your neighbors market. to sign on. There's like no wrong way to do this. And you can demonstrate immediately. And remember, you don't have to have the cast of thousands, but it's wonderful if you can have a few more signatures on that letter beside yourself. It gives them a leg to stand on, and it and perhaps you'll find some people in your neighborhood that may wish to go with you on this visit as well. Uh, I saw a great question in the chat. How do we access the letter? Everybody that signed up, we will email you as attachments the letter. So you will get the letter. Now, um, how do you find your legislator's office? If it is a Senate office, we've got the link, senate.gov slash, and you're also going to get this presentation, so you will have that link. And then your house member. So if you were going to go to their website, normally it's the member's last name, .senate.gov. If it's a house member, it's their last name, .house.gov. So my house member is Abigail Spanberger. So for me, it would be spanberger.house.gov. And then I've got warner.senate.gov and kane.senate.gov. So yes, it's very straightforward. Now, when you're doing this meeting, a meeting and a protest are two different things. You might hold a protest and then go into a meeting. We used to do that all the time. Or if it's just a meeting, three to five people, it might be just you. You don't need a cast of thousands. If you can present a diverse constituency, an older person, a younger person, various people of color, that lets the elected officials see, okay, we are going across many different lines for support or opposition to this. Be respectful, be early, look presentable. So sandals and flip-flops 
are not appropriate for a congressional visit. You don't have to be in a suit and tie, uh, regular slacks, nice shirt, uh, reasonable jacket. And then if you have the slightest amount of, oh, I'm a little uncomfortable, I'm a little nervous, get somebody to practice with you. Role play. Professional actors do it. You are not a professional advocate. There is nothing wrong with getting somebody to practice role playing with you. Now, if you've got five people um, or there's more than you, then people are going to have roles and you're going to want to assign who is going to do what. So you don't get in the meeting and you're all going, ah, oh, who's doing what? Figure that out at a time. Who is going to run the meeting, guide the conversation? Who is going to tell a story about how this bill has had an impact? Who is the person who is going to look the legislator, the staff member in the eye and say, do we have your support or opposition on this, whatever it is. You're going to have an educator, somebody that has many of the facts about the bill. They may not know everything, but they're comfortable talking about what's in it. And then you have that quiet, shy person who's going to collect everybody's cards and is going to give everybody's cards to whoever is uh, representing the elected, and then they're going to take notes. If I could, the note taking is extremely important because you can be in the thick of conversation, then you get out the door and people are like, wait, did I hear him say that? Oh no, he said this. But when you have a note taker, you have it down. And the other thing is, you know, making the ask. That's always that moment, right? When you're having the dialogue with them and then somebody really puts it on the line. Do we have your support for HR 51? Do we have your support for S 51? And then whatever you do, don't say anything. Please, please don't say anything. Just wait. You might even feel a little bit nervous, butterflies in your stomach, but wait. Give the senator, give the member of Congress, give the staffer a moment to respond. Let them sit in that hot seat. Let them sit in that discomfort. That has a wonderful way of working on them. Now, staffers may not be ready to commit either way, but I don't want you to feel if you draw a staffer for a meeting, that is not a bad thing because remember, Remember, the staff people are constantly with elected officials, educating them, making arguments pro and con. So staff people are very important people. So if you draw the card and you end up meeting with a staff person, again, take that opportunity to learn through the meeting. As Andrea said, you not only learn their framework, you start to hear their arguments, you start to identify, ooh, Ooh, she really cares about this. And the next time you come back, you can incorporate that knowledge in. Sorry, Andrea, just wanted to jump oh, in. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, Andrea, it, I wanted to it. add one thing too as well. Okay. So also guys, I know a lot of people have like posters and all types of things. So you normally can't do that in the offices, but what you can do, we're talking about what you can wear. You can wear a shirt, like my shirt I have on today or a button or something that you can actually pin to yourself those are also very beneficial. One, because the person that you're talking with is going to see it. But two, when you're passing other members who just may be passing, they're like, oh, wow, we got some people advocating on this issue. That's right. That's, thank when, you, Kelsey. When we were advocating on the Equal Rights Amendment, we had thousands of the round ERA buttons. We would all have our pins when we went in the meeting and we would bring pins and we would leave pins for the staff groups. And occasionally in the state offices, we would see the staffers with the pins um, on the uh, side of their suit jacket. So yes. Um, I'm gonna do this really, really quickly. You are going to have this. This is not a long meeting. You're not going to be there an hour. 
you're maybe going to be there 15 minutes, 20 minutes is a really long meeting. Introduction, who's here? Their name, what city are they from? Why we are here? You've got petitions. We've got 700 signatures, 25 signatures, um, asking you to support S51, HR51. You're only going to take two to three minutes to have your storytellers say why this is important. I lived in the city of DC and I got tired of not having a representative who could vote on issues that were important to me. So I moved back to Maryland or whatever. And then you need that person willing to ask the question. And you ask the question, you stop, you wait, you let it get uncomfortable. He who speaks first, loses. All right, and then you're gonna wrap up and you're going to give them the letter. Now, some people like to give them the letter in the beginning, then they're reading the letter. I always gave them the letter at the end because that was the summary of what we had spoken about. Um, engage the staff or pause after each main point. Ask the staff or if they have any questions or the member, whomever. If there's anything that's complex, do we need a const don't we need a constitutional amendment to make DC uh, state? No, we don't. Well, what about Amendment 23? We would immediately repeal that. I mean, if they know about that stuff, yeah, we have an answer for it. If they don't, we don't need to create any additional choke points. And then listen for how are they making their arguments? Sometimes their arguments make absolutely no sense. But behind those arguments that don't make any sense, you begin to go, it's got nothing to do with that. It's got everything to do with this. Um, the ask, I'm going to make it really, really simple. The very first two items, ask the question, be silent, and wait for the answer. If you get a yes, this is so great to hear. Who else should I talk to? Who else can you bring on board? And then if they say no, what's, what's holding you back? What is really the challenge for you with this legislation? Generally, they'll tell you. All right, and then we've got the handout. Now, once you've had a meeting, thank the legislator. Mm -hmm. People remember thank yous, even if they said no. As a matter of fact, if they said no to you, they remember the thank you yeah. even more. Oh, we told them no. We basically told them we had absolutely no interest. And we were never going to sign on a piece of legislation like that. That's what they used to tell me. They're going to be nice to her to you. They didn't like me. Uh, but they always got a thank you letter. You want to build support and make sure you're ready for the next meeting. Stay in touch. Keep the relationship alive. And the name of our organization, try to find common ground. I'm not going to go through all this. Um, I am going to close my part and go, Noel, let's talk about democracy circles, how people can get together and how you can get ready to make these visits. And now we're giving you letters for the Congress. However, in many states, your state house is actually in session. All the principles that we're giving you work at any level of dealing with an elected official, federal, state, or your local government. Noel, take it away. Okay. Well, democracy circles are a very simple concept. Basically, it's the idea of getting a small group of people who join together regularly to fight voter suppression, to demand the democracy we need, which is, of course, a truly multiracial, multicultural democracy. And Forming a democracy circle is a way to build our grassroots powers. Democracy circles take all kinds of actions together. One of those 
actions can be to visit their member of Congress, to visit their senator and advocate for S-51 or H.R. 51. But there are other actions as well. Andrea, could you go to the next slide? So each democracy circle is started by a convener who picks a meeting time and a place and brings together people they know. It might be bringing them together on Zoom, like this democracy circle, or it could be across a kitchen table. But the idea is these are your folks, and together you're going to take action together, and you're going to learn about how to counter attacks on our democracy now. At the worker circle, we'll provide all the resources you need, training. You just bring your energy and your people. Next slide. Democracy circles build power by gathering and equipping people with whom you're already connected. It's an adaptable model that you can take and put it in the form you need in the way that it makes sense for you. Maybe it's around a kitchen table. Maybe it's a congregational monthly meeting. Maybe you're meeting after a protest. But what we do is provide take action opportunities and resources for discussion. Democracy circles are a way for people to take action. So you'll see here on this slide, just a few ways that we can take action in a strategic way. These are Center for Common Ground. You're, you're so familiar with this. You can postcard, you can phone bank. There is so much that you can do. You can make a timely legislative visit. There are other options as well. You might become an election protection volunteer or a poll worker. There are many different ways uh, and options that we give you to take action. Next slide. One of the things that people really appreciate about this is some of you are people of action. You've already been out there postcarding. You've been out there making legislative visits. You've been out there marching. But what you might be interested in is learning a little bit more about what is that filibuster that keeps bedeviling us every single time we try to get legislation passed. How does it work? Uh, how do those federal courts work, by the way? And what about the Freedom to Vote Act? What are the key components of that and what would it change? Well, we provide a whole range of discussion resources. These are all evidence-based resources. We might have an article from the Brennan Center. There might be uh, uh, an article from the New York Times. There could be, um, in, in addition to articles and, and things like that, we have poetry, we have videos, we have books. So this allows you to dive in learn about topics that are of interest to you, and then we'll provide some discussion questions and you can engage those uh, discussion questions yourself. We provide these resources, but you make them your own. Next slide. You don't have to have any previous experience to start a democracy circle. In fact, we created them especially for people who have never done anything like this before. People who are seeing the direction of our country and saying, this is not where we should be headed. I want to do something. I'm not sure what. Here's your answer. Start a democracy circle. It's very simple. When you sign up to be a convener, our social justice uh, organizer Noah Barron will give you a call and set up a time and walk you through. We have a take action guide and we have a getting started guide and we have an outreach guide. We have plenty of helps so that you can understand what are some of the best practices for reaching out to people that you don't know, as well as reaching back to people that you do know. Democracy circles build power and community. Next slide. One of our worker circle members put it this way. Democracy circles allow us to share our ideas and feelings with other activists, be heard and hear others, give and get support, and have agency, not feel as helpless as we might in the face of rising fascism in our country.
Because after all, the best answer to fascist politics is engaged citizens who know the history, who understand the building blocks of our democracy, and who take action together to ensure political equality and the full participation of everyone, including the 700,000 plus people of DC. And so if you, this sounds interesting to you, if you think, oh, this is a model I might be able to use in my or union organizing or in the senior center or at my congregation, we would love to share more. You can find out more about Democracy Circles and sign up and have a conversation with us. We'd love to share and we hope you'll consider doing this and, and then get some of your Democracy Circles to go make visits together. Thanks. Or at least sign your letter. Or at least sign Kelsey's letter. That's right. And we sign got Kelsey's Noah's letter, please. <laughs> yes. And we've got Noah's email on the slide. So you can go to circle.org slash democracy or just email nbaron at circle.org. All right. This was a rousing kind of fun thing. I had a I lot did. of fun with this. I did want to add one thing, Andrea. Uh, I know some people really love the Capitol, the White House, all of the federal monuments. I know that you guys exist, okay? I'm just happy to not be one of them. As a resident of D.C., I see them all the time, so they actually just don't phase me anymore. I don't care. <laughs> but I will tell you, you will not lose those items and they still will be federally regulated. So those items will still be considered the federal district and DC, as um, Andrea mentioned, will become Fred the Com Frederick Douglass Commonwealth. So just wanted to throw that out there. Yes, yes. All right, uh, I got a lot of questions answered in the chat. John, are you seeing, or Josie, are you seeing anything that we did not answer. I don't see anything I, that. Yeah, I, I don't either. Um, I will send out, an, I know we're over time too, so, but I will send out an email, a follow-up email probably tomorrow with the recording and slides. And if you all have any other questions that come up, please feel free to respond to that email and um, I'll be able to help you out. Um, and Josie, yeah. that'll also have the toolkit in it, yes. right, for making a visit the and the letter as well. Exactly. Great. Fantastic. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kelsey Adams, for being with us and bringing the power of D.C. into this conversation. We're going to go out there and stand up for D.C. until our Congress makes D.C. the 51st state. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, everybody from all across the country for taking time to be in community together, to learn together. Yeah. And go out there and make your visits. Let us know how they go. We really are eager to hear about that. And join us next month. We have these um, effective advocate trainings each month. And so stay tuned. The next one's coming in. When is it? I think it's April. It's a Thursday. April 14th, maybe? Something like that. I should have put uh, written. I'm not yeah. doing a very good preview. Josie, do you know when it is? The next, our next meeting. I think um, the next is, one is the 11th of April. April Thursday, 11th. April 11th. Yes. Yep. Join us back here Thursday, April 11th. And we would love to continue this conversation with you. And hang on. I am dropping a link in the chat, or at least theoretically I am. April <laughs> 11th. Yes. There we go. Yes. All right. <laughs> Have a great evening, everybody. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks for everybody. Bye. Bye.